Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, evening, or morning. Um, I hope you see my screen. Uh, my name is Sonia Vilicic. I'm based in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, give me just one second. Okay, so um, I will talk a little bit about uh, Jewish history or Jewish community in Serbia. I will talk a little bit about myself, my Jewish identity and what I do in the world uh, today. So uh, for the beginning, I know that there are a lot of people on the call, but I will ask you four very short questions. Okay, I will show you images of different things and they are connected to Serbia and, in, and try to answer how they're connected to Serbia. Maybe who they are, they're people. So uh, let's start with this one. Who is this guy? Somebody knows maybe? <laughs> Djokovic. Yeah. Okay, Novak Djokovic, a famous tennis player, a hero of uh, Serbia. Um, this lady maybe? The harder one, I know. Ka Maria Isn't Kalman. Marina Abramovic, very close. It's Marina Abramovic, she's an artist. Uh, she lives in New York and um, she was uh, a guest in MoMA for many, many, many uh, times. Very interesting artist, a little bit crazy, but uh, that's my, that's my, um, that's how I see her. Um, and this one, can somebody tell me? It's getting harder and harder. Nikola Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> Okay, great. Nikola Tesla, uh, he was a guy who invented, we think, electricity um, and yeah. uh, uh, the, the bulbs, the light, etc., etc., together with Edison. Um, and he is from Big Claim Serbia, Croatians claim Croatia. You know, um, there is a tension also regarding that in this, uh, in this region. And this guy, who is this guy, and how is he connected to Serbia? Who is this? Anyone? Mara, I'm pretty sure you know. Yes, this is Brad Pitt. Sorry, I think other people know as well, but they're just, uh, they're muted. <laughs> okay, okay. Any idea how is he connected to Serbia? Um, I'm guessing he has a uh, heritage, Serbian heritage. Really nice try, but He's not connected to Serbia. I'm just wondering how present you are, people. So uh, no connection with Brad Pitt and Serbia, unfortunately, although I love him <laughs> as, an, as an actor. Okay, so when we talk about Serbia, we talk about the region that is focused on this, uh, on this slide. Um, it's surrounded by former Yugoslavia. I will go a little bit, I will talk a little bit about that. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, um, Slovenia these days, um, and it's in, in the terminology of Western, in Western terminology, this is the area of Western Balkan. To be honest, local people never knew why we are called Western Balkan. It doesn't make sense to us. It is part of the Balkan Peninsula, but uh, why, why Western Balkan? We, we, don't really, uh, we don't really understand, but that's the terminology everybody uh, uses. Uh, Serbia was part of uh, Yugoslavia or former Yugoslavia that many of you on this call, um, I guess, uh, were, were present when, when the, the, the war in former Yugoslavia began. Um, it was one country that was divided in uh, many smaller countries. And of course, it affected uh, the Jews and the Jewish community. And we'll, I will talk about that also a little bit uh, later. So. Uh, we have three waves of immigration of Jews to Serbia. The first wave came after the destruction of the Second Temple with uh, Romans, and these are called Romaniotti Jews. Uh, we don't have traces of Romaniotti Jews in Serbia anymore. Uh, we know that now, today, these days, they exist in some parts of Greece, in Italy, and probably some other places, but they were completely assimilated with the next wave. Uh, with the next wave of big uh, migration of Jews to Serbia. And these are Sephardic Jews or after the Spanish Inquisition. And after the Sephardic Jews, there was a big immigration of Ashkenazi Jews with Austro-Hungarian um, Austro Empire. 
So when we talk about Sephardic Jews, um, it's a very classical story of Sephardic Jews. They were expelled from Spain and Portugal. And with the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Empire allowed Jews to settle in different areas of Ottoman Empire. So they reached um, places like Bulgaria, like Bosnia and Serbia, central and southern parts of, of uh, Serbia. So this, this, was a very, this was one of the centers of Sephardic Jews. This was never a very big Jewish community and I'll talk about that, but um, there is a very, still today, very present Sephardic uh, culture among the Jewish uh, community uh, members. Um, like everywhere else, um, Jews were allowed to settle in certain parts of the area. They were allowed to do certain parts of professions like trade, um, mainly, um, and they were actually settled in the place which is considered the city center today. Okay, and I'm talking about the Belgrade, the capital, the capital city. So the Jews back then it was not a city center, but today, if we think about the Jewish area, it is absolutely in the city center. It's close to river, which was also common in many other places because of the trade and need for Jews to um, to be close to to the things that they are, they are doing um, and they are dealing with. Um, the, the Jews, uh, Sephardic Jews also here spoke Ladino, they had their newspapers, they had the way how they were dressed, which was completely different than uh, Ashkenazi Jews that will, that will come uh, later. Um, the music that you heard a minute ago, it's uh, a music by this band, it's called Shira Utfila. And it's um, a band that plays Sephardic music from the Balkans. And it's multi-faith band led by the guy in the middle. He's a Hazan of the Belgrade Synagogue. And it's the band that has all free religion uh, represented um, and, and, uh, I do, and uh, somebody from India. And I think it's just beautiful that all of them together are nurturing the Sephardic culture in Belgrade. Um, I am Ashkenazi Jew and I always love more <laughs> Sephardic cuisine. So this is one, one burekas um, that, that is also very present in my community where I am um, today. Um, Ashkenazi Jews arrived to Serbia, mainly to the Northern part of Serbia. So this is the map of Serbia. Belgrade is, as you can see here, and it's called the, the Middle Serbia. Northern part of Serbia, it's called Vojvodina. And Ashkenazi Jews mainly settled there um, with Ottoman Empire. So all these communities, I'm coming from Northern part of Serbia. It's really on the border with Hungary. And all the communities in Vojvodina were Ashkenazi communities and Neolog communities. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Neolog stream of Judaism. It's a, uh, it, it exists, it exists in, it developed in Hungary. It's something in between, it's kind of conservative uh, stream, but it's not really conservative. Um, so it, it's called Neolog. Um, and from Hungary, this stream also came to Serbia with Ashkenazi Jews. So we had or very Orthodox Jewish communities in this part of Serbia and Neolog Jewish communities. There is a difference in service. There are organs in Neolog, um, in Neolog synagogues compared to other Ashkenazi synagogues where, where for example, they, they, don't, um, they don't exist. Um, so I, I mentioned all these uh, all these things that um, mainly the Ashkenazi Jews settled in um, northern part of Serbia, but um, they also reached Belgrade together with Austro-Hungarians. Um, and what is interesting is that actually there was a clash between the Jews because the Jews of Belgrade, they were protecting Ottoman Empire. There was a, a war between two empires, Ottoman Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Jews, you, both empires had their, their Jews. So basically Jews probably uh, were fighting each other uh, in the name of their empires. Um, so when uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire reached Belgrade, um, the Jewish community also established uh, itself here. It was always a minority community. So Sephardic community was in Belgrade always bigger than, than Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi community. Of course, Ask Ashkenazi Jews, like everywhere else, um, their language uh, be besides the local language was Yiddish. They had their newspaper and their cultural life and they had 
their, uh, their food that is different than um, Sephardic, Sephardic food. Um, emancipation of Jews in both parts of Serbia actually began in quite um, similar similar time um, with Hungarian Empire. It stopped to be uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So in the in the parts of northern Serbia, um, just in 1867, um, Jews gained equal rights. And of course, it's a process. It didn't happen in 1867 that all Jews had all equal rights. But actually, there was a law that uh, should give Jews uh, equal rights. And in the independent part of Serbia um, is the, the, the part that is Belgrade and Southern of Belgrade that um, actually fought against Ottoman Empire. And Ottoman Empire is no longer ruling that part of Serbia. Serbia has its independence. And uh, the Jews, together with all other minorities, uh, got uh, their rights in 1878. Uh, um, they were, there was a, a very rich Jewish life um, in uh, both communities, both in Ashkenazi and both in uh, Sephardic, uh, Sephardic communities. It's interesting that in Belgrade, because both communities exist, they had their separate uh, woman society. The, actually, Sephardic woman society was the first woman society in Serbia. Um, which is, which is, I think, very, very nice. Uh, Ashkenazi Women's Society had their own uh, place and or own organization. Um, there was a singing society, Zionistic uh, societies of, uh, of Yugoslavia, that's how it was called. Then they established a federation, umbrella organization of all Jewish communities that, um, that uh, was called the Federation of Jewish Religious Communities. Uh, and it still exists today. Um, and again, fun fact is that the Federation of Jewish Communities of uh, Yugoslavia gave um, equal rights to, to women, to Jewish women in 33, which was much before than actually the state of Serbia did. So I, I would say that we were a little bit progressive as, as Jews um, over here. Um, like in many parts of Europe, um, Holocaust absolutely um, devastated this community. Um, this is the, again the map of Yugoslavia, not of Serbia. Serbia is here, and Yugoslavia was really divided by different uh, occupiers, um, and depends where in which part of Yugoslavia you were. Uh, that was your destiny, basically, as a Jew. So, um, as you can see, Serbia was occupied. Parts of the Serbia was occupied by Croatian uh, Ustasha. That. That how, that's how they were called. And the, the, the Belgrade was occupied by um, German occupation. Um, and basically by 41, there were no, the, uh, the Serbia was declared, uh, or Belgrade was declared uh, free of Jews. There were no um, men and uh, women and, and children in Belgrade, Jewish, uh, in, Jewish, uh, in Jewish Belgrade by 41. So the Holocaust in this part of, of Yugoslavia happened quite early um, in contrast to the Holocaust in my part of uh, Serbia where I'm coming from, it's Northern Serbia, which was under Hungarian occupation. So the Jews of my city had the same destiny like the Jews of, of Budapest, and they were deported in 44. So it really depends in which part of Yugoslavia you were during the Holocaust as a Jew. Um, and, and of course, there was a movement between all these countries um, and th that your destiny was basically depending on the, the country, what Yugoslavian country you were in uh, during that time. Um, Serbia was never, or Yugoslavia was never the biggest Jewish community. Um, before the Holocaust, there were around 80,000 Jews. Um, in Serbia, just 16,000. But the percentage of Jews murdered is very high because eight, almost 88% of the community perished in Holocaust and uh, just 5,000 uh, people survived. Um, many of them immediately after the, after the Holocaust, when they returned, they moved out of Serbia, mainly to uh, US, Canada, and Israel. Um, many of them moved out later on, and I will, I will talk about it. But the community that is present today um, 
try to revive itself. So the federation again uh, try to um, uh, manage all the existing Jewish communities. Of course, many communities were uh, completely empty. Uh, many smaller communities in villages and many synagogues were abandoned even today. Um, and many synagogues in Serbia were actually uh, destroyed after the Holocaust with the second, uh, with the next uh, regime that, that ruled um, with communism. So because there were no, no Jews in many villages, uh, communists didn't think they should preserve these sites. So most of the synagogues in northern part of Serbia were destroyed um, after the Holocaust and during uh, communism. Um, because of the number, uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jewish community uh, became one as a one community. So today, even today, we actually pray in Ashkenazi synagogue in Belgrade. It's one of the two functioning synagogues in all of Serbia. Um, and uh, the rabbi is Sephardic. Majority of communities probably Sephardic. The building is Ashkenazi because that's the that's the, that's the synagogue that remain. Um, but also there is one. Um, one sports society, one woman society, there are no uh, divisions anymore between Ashkenazi and, and Sephardic Jews. Um, and of course, this community was highly uh, influenced by the wars in former Yugoslavia because many Jews left again. Um, they didn't, they were living in different parts of, of Yugoslavia and um, they were friends. Uh, my parents have friends in Croatia or in Bosnia, and um, they they went to the uh, Jewish summer camps together, um, and they just didn't want to fight, or they didn't think they they should fight against not just Jews but against all these uh, people that are living uh, across the border. So um, and and of course the Jews had much more chance to leave than other people because of other uh, international Jewish organizations, mainly. Um, joint distribution committee that was really active here during the 90s that evacuated many, many people from all, all the parts of uh, former Yugoslavia uh, during the war. So it left this community uh, today with a really uh, small number. Uh, there are around 3,000 Jews in, uh, in all Serbia. Uh, there are nine functioning communities, uh, which means that um, if we think about 3,000 people, it's a small, small number. But uh, when we say a community here, it can be a, a, a two families. So we have a community of Sombor that probably has <clears throat> like 30 members, uh, and they are trying to maintain somehow um, a Jewish life. Um, most of the community members are secular. Uh, we have one rabbi. In all the, for all the country, he's an Orthodox rabbi, and we have Chabad from for last maybe 10 years, uh, but community in general is uh, secular. It is also very uneducated community because we don't have a Jewish infrastructure, um, meaning we don't have Jewish schools, Jewish kindergarten, uh, we don't have a kosher shop, um, um, but we have a very, um, I think, important <laughs> and very rich cultural life, Jewish culture, cultural life, meaning that community would meet um, not necessarily, um, they would meet around Jewish holidays, but they won't necessarily go to synagogue. Uh, they will do something else. Um, and we have two functioning synagogues in, in the whole country. One is in uh, Belgrade and in the capital, and one is in the city where, where I'm coming from. Um, so this was really a very short in introduction about a uh, Jewish community of, of, uh, of Serbia. There are many layers, of course, to this community. And um, of, of course, all the, this area is very, uh, there is a lot of tension and historically as well, uh, meaning that many empires were clashing over this area, like uh, Ottoman Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it all influences of course, the Jewish Jewish community and the last word that I also mentioned uh, influences the the numbers of the Jewish community. We don't think that we will ever grow as a Jewish community, not because um, we we are we know that we are not Berlin or Germany, where many, for example, Russian Jews 
uh, moved um, after the fall of Soviet Union. Um, Serbia is not really attractive to people economically, politically. So we can be um, very honest and we can, we can conclude that this community most probably will never grow in numbers. Um, uh, but community is really trying to maintain um, some kind of, of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish life. So I'm one of the members of this community and I'm coming from the city called Subotica, which has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful synagogue that was renovated uh, just a few years ago. So throughout my childhood, this synagogue was completely neglected, uh, but it was renovated, as I say, probably like five, five years ago. Um, I didn't know that I was Jewish until the age of nine. And actually um, the war in former Yugoslavia led my family back to the community because just to give a context, the war was between, uh, people say it, it was between national na nations uh, like Croatia and Serbia and Bosnian, but it was also a war between religions because in Bosnia, majority of people are Muslim. In Croatia, majority of people are Christian Catholics. And in Serbia, majority of people like, are uh, Christian Orthodox. So actually the war was also uh, between uh, religions and something that doesn't happen uh, often in Jewish history. In this moment, it was best to be Jewish because we were completely out of, of the conflict uh, on some level. Right, so I think that that's why my parents decided to to take us to the Jewish community. The first holiday, first time I entered the Jewish community, uh, I was it was Purim, and I of course I loved it. I was nine years old, and uh, already then war was happening in uh, in Yugoslavia, and I remember that there was an Austrian Jewish community came to visit, and they brought us. Uh, a lot of food and presents and everything because we were under sanctions like Russians today, for example. Um, and, and I completely loved it. And uh, that summer, um, somebody told to my parents that there is a Jewish summer camp in Hungary uh, called Sarvash. This is, I'm not on the picture, it, it's my friends. Um, so Sarvash is international Jewish summer camp that in the end, I happened to grow up there. I was there for almost 20 years, first as a, as a very small child, and then as a counselor, and then as a program director, uh, when I started working for um, JDC, for, uh, for, um, yeah, for, for JOIN. Um, and um, the camp was really a place that um, gave me my Jewish identity and majority of my Jewish knowledge that, that I have uh, that I have today and also connected me to the Jews uh, from, from different countries. I'm sorry, I have dogs. That's uh, sometimes they are, they are loud. Um, so Sarbash was a central place um, for, for Jews from, from Eastern and Central Europe. But in particular for Jews, in the beginning in particular for Jews from former Yugoslavia, because the children from all these countries were allowed, they were not allowed to move between former Yugoslavian countries, but they were allowed to go out. And what happens is that actually the, the, we, the children of our parents, were meeting in the summer camp and parents were sending each other letters, food, money, and different things. Um, and it was a great uh, connection point for, for the generation of my parents and grandparents that didn't have any, they, they could just not see each other. Um, besides that also, um, it was not easy for, for, uh, for the group to be united because we come from the conflict zones, but um, the, the, the camp and, and my counselors, they really worked hard on it. Uh, they really worked uh, hard on um, teaching us that, that we are Jewish and that the conflict and propaganda that we get at home should not enter uh, the Jewish world and Jewish community. And for me, as, as somebody who 
really was covered with propaganda from all sides, um, not from my family, but from, from the society. It was really helpful and I'm grateful for that because I grew up a little bit different than, than my friends that didn't have this experience. So uh, Sarvash camp was a central point for, of, of my Jewish identity. And also um, it's a classical story of Eastern, Eastern and Central European Jews that um, the generation of my parents didn't know anything about Judaism. Um, as I said, I didn't know I was Jewish until I was nine. Later on, I just realized that my father, uh, my father is Jewish, my mother converted to, to Judaism. My father had many, many Jewish friends and I just didn't know that, uh, I just didn't know that because he never mentioned. So he tried socially somehow to be connected to the Jewish community, but in terms of knowledge, in terms of practice, uh, practicing Judaism, we didn't get anything at home. And we would come back from, from the summer camp and we will try to teach our parents um, how to light candles, what, what means what, uh, and stuff like that. So it was a little bit opposite. So we were educating parents and basically our Jewish community, um, the older generation of our Jewish community, which I'm still, um, still, doing, st still doing today. Um, to transfer to that part of, of, um, of a session, um, I'm working, I established an organization called Haver Serbia. Haver in Hebrew means a friend. Um, and it's an organization that um, develops Jewish community um, through educating members of Jewish community, but also uh, builds bridges between Jewish community and general society. So what I would like you to do now is I will just show you a few images. Um, if you can just think when I go through the images, can you just think what you think is happening uh, in the picture? What is the age? approximate age of the people on the picture, um, where is the action taking place, indoors, outdoors, mosque, synagogue, school, I don't know, um, and what could be the possible topics. Okay, I will just run very fast through 10 pictures um, and just think about that. You can also unmute yourself. It might be hard with this number of people, but please, please feel uh, free to do it. And you can also write in the chat and Mara and Danny um, will share it with me. So these are the pictures. So what is happening? What are the ages? Where is it taking place? And what could be the possible topics? Thank you, Sonia. I, um, just with this number of people, I think it may be best. I opened the chat so people can now share uh, with everyone. Uh, so okay, if they, great. Thank like you. Thank you. I, I see Catherine raised a hand. I think it's best, yeah, uh, to put in the chat any of the answers. That way we could all see. And Sonia, may, uh, maybe repeat the question one more time. Yes, I can also go reverse. Um, so the question is just to look at the pictures, see, try to figure out what is happening on them. What are the ages? We are trying together to build up what my organization is doing. So what are the ages? What is happening? What is the setup? Um, basically, that's it. That's it. Okay, I'm going. So for those who, uh, who aren't able to access chat, I can, we can read out a couple of the answers. So someone said Hanukkah, three girls, nine years. Someone said teens and then all ages. Someone said cemetery and synagogue views. That's what we got so far. Ooh. 
Other comments have been uh, Havdala with um, LGBTQT uh, inclusion, young and old learning, Havdala teenagers, intergenerational, cemetery searching for grave, Jewish education, lighting menorah, socializing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, you covered almost everything. Um, so, uh, as I said, it's uh, the organization, it's run by Jews, um, female Jews at this point, not that we are uh, exclu excluding uh, men, but that's how, how it is. It's an educational organization that covers all ages, um, not very small kids, but from um, primary school, uh, from 10 years old um, on. Um, and it's an organization that has three major topics, uh, Jewish culture, tradition, and history, uh, Jewish heritage, uh, Holocaust, and anti-Semitism and discrimination in Serbia today. And through all these three topics, we do different projects, and we try to create spaces where Jews and non-Jews will meet and will learn uh, Jewish stuff. Um, so one, one of the things, somebody said Havdalah, Havdalah, was the, the people that you saw in the picture are uh, free volunteers that are non-Jewish of our organization with two volunteers that are Jewish. Um, there were pictures with, with somebody holding a text or a picture. So we, we have uh, short courses on, on different Jewish topics. Uh, yesterday we finished uh, one around Purim. Um, and and um, Jews and non-Jews come and learn together. Um, we also, somebody mentioned LGBT something. We, we have a, a festival of uh, Jewish and Israel, Israeli um, culture and, and, and film, um, where again, we try to bridge LGBT community, which is these days, unfortunately, uh, at least in Serbia, um, they don't know they're anti-Semitic, but they are uh, because of their view of Israel and uh, putting that view on us as Jews who live in Serbia. So we are trying to break these prejudices. We are trying to build bridges between different communities. So one of the purpose of the festival is actually to, to have a dialogue, to talk and to introduce uh, Jewish culture and Israeli culture through LGBT lens. And on the other hand, is also the purpose is also to open up um, a local Jewish community. Um, Serbia is not very open. It's a very homophobic country, unfortunately. Uh, it's a very conservative country. And the community, I wouldn't say they are not openly homophobic, but, but they don't uh, create spaces for LGBT Jews. Um, locally. So our aim is really to empower um, L local LGBT Jews um, to, to um, create a space for them and also to try to move forward the Jewish community. Um, we have heritage tours that, um, that are led by non-Jews. We train them and then currently we have seven uh, tours in seven cities. Um, in in majority of cities, there is no existing Jewish community. It doesn't exist. Um, and through these uh, tours, we are trying to nurture the the history and culture of Jews of that uh, of that city. So, um, as I said, we are activists and educational organization with uh, with the hope that we will uh, empower and develop both our Jewish community and our society. Um, yeah, I would say I would say maybe from my side, um, for the time being, the yeah, I would I would maybe stop here and and take some questions. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see where it takes us. Um, I think to uh, get up the ball rolling while we get questions in, uh, maybe perhaps from Mara or if they want or if people want to put in the chat. I'm kind of curious. Um, I know you, Sonia, from meeting you in Birmingham at the famous or not so famous, who knows, uh, Limud Festival uh, at the end of December. I'm curious uh, what kind of reactions you've received by going to an international Jewish festival like Limud in Birmingham when you first tell people you're from Serbia. Mm. Oh, it's a great question. I mean, first people people miss mix uh, Siberia 
and Serbia. So usually that's what I get. Siberia, wow, but that's very cold. I'm not judgmental. I'm just saying that's what, what people say. And then I'm like, first time I encountered that, I'm like, I mean, it is cold, but it's not so cold. And then uh, I realized they're thinking about Siberia, which is also very authentic. I have no idea if there are Jews uh, there. Um, um, I mean, people are, general people are surprised that there is a Jewish community. Maybe not these days, but 10 years ago or 15 years ago, because internationally we were not so connected. I'm very, besides the work that I do locally for Haver Serbia, I'm also a Jewish educator for European Union of Jewish Students. And I was volunteering for international organizations, worked for joint, like I had a very international Jewish life, but that's not very common for maybe the generation that came after me, it became more, more common, but we as, as Jews in Serbia, we are under sanctions, so we couldn't really move, right? Um, I could go to the summer camp, but my parents were not able to leave the country, right? So, so um, people were not aware that there is a Jewish community, also Serbia and also, I would say, former Yugoslavia. All these communities are very small these days. Maybe people heard about Bosnia and Sarajevo Haggadah because that's very, like, uh, unique and famous, but people were just not aware that there is existing Jewish life. So, I mean, I'm really happy and privileged that I can share that story because I think it's important that there is, even though a very small community, there is a community that tries to build itself um, and that tries to be Jewish however they, they can. Well, I, I think it's a, a huge recommendation and, uh, or, or com a comment on, on your perseverance and everyone that you're working with. Uh, to kind of, you know, rebuild and recreate Jewish life in a place that perhaps most people aren't, aren't familiar or, 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 or don't know that, that, um, that there's such an incredible history there. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in, so I just want to put the disclaimer that we're going to try and get to all of them as much as best as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, wouldn't, I wonder if you wouldn't mind, a question has come in about asking how and why did you learn about your, your being Jewish when you were nine years old? Uh, can you just repeat how and why? Or I guess if you wanted to explain a little bit of the context of how you mentioned that mm. you learned the, of your Jew Jewish history or Jewish um, identity, rather, uh, when you were nine years old, and if you wanted to mm. to speak speak to that, what happened, what was going on at that time in your family, if if yeah, you wanted sure. to share. Yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. So as I mentioned, I mean the war in, in Yugoslavia broke <laughs> broke out and. Um, Everyone was, of course, uh, of course, scared. And, and uh, my parents realized that, you know, religion plays a very important part in that war, um, like many, many other people. Um, and I guess, you know, the Jewish, my, my father has a flat that actually has a view on the synagogue and it's like two minutes walk from the Jewish community. And, you know, like, I wouldn't say that they were never connected because my grandmother, um, got matzes for Pesach. I just didn't know like what is it, and like she didn't want. She never wanted to, to explain to me. And it's also very common for a Holocaust survivors not to not to share their stories, um, especially the survivors that stayed. Okay, s survivors that went from the country that uh, where where it happened to them. They 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 are, I think, more open to share, but here it took a lot of time, 60 years maybe, for, for survivors to, to start sharing. So uh, it was never mentioned in my family. And because of the war, I guess, you know, and the friends that my parents had, um, the friends told my, my family, like, come to Jewish community, it's, it's a poor time, um, and let's see what happens. And, and I think, you know, Rila, as a parent of, of two kids that, that are so young and with a lot of sanctions and I, also the food sanction, clothes sanction and everything, I, I think parents also saw that there is international Jewish community that is helping out. And um, it might seem not fair for because there are many non-Jews that couldn't get this help, but uh, I think they felt it, it's a safe space for us. So after they took us to the community and we really liked it, it was enough just to be one summer in the summer camp and 
you know, you just love it and you want to go back and you want to go back and you want to go back. So, so that's what happened basically, you know, and I began, as I said, I began learning together with my older brother, learning everything in the Jewish summer camp. Um, and, and we just uh, went back home and, and we, we taught our parents, um, also, this is what happens today. Many people of my generation, and maybe a little bit younger, that grew up in a summer camp and that have this positive Jewish identity and positive Jewish experiences, they are those who teach uh, elderly in their community. So all the workshops that we do with adults, their people are older than me, uh, but they learn from me and my colleague and, and two other friends that just love it. Thank you. Um, there's uh, well, a couple of questions uh, that we're asking about the music at the beginning. And I, I, I wanted to share with everyone in the chat, and please, Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, that the band was Shira Utfila. Is that, is that yes. possible? Okay, yes, one. yes, that's possible. That's possible. Um, I will also share yeah. the link uh, of this song, but then uh, can I share it with everybody? Yeah. Sure. And then the uh, other, the, uh, some interesting fun facts that came up in this uh, in this question, uh, uh, sorry, in this in the chat. Marco let us know that something interesting about Serbia is that the grandparents of Theodore Herzl are actually buried in Zemun near Belgrade. Yes. Did not know. Yes. Um, hi, Marco. He's a good friend of mine. He was my ah. family in the summer camp. Uh, ah. um, so. Yes, I mean uh, the grandparents of the of Theodor Herzl are buried here. Um, at some point, Israel wanted to take um, the remains to to Israel, but they have descendants here, so there is a family lineage that uh, that is still present and alive. And the the deal was that they want they want to do it. Um, also, Rabbi Alkali, uh, who is who is before Herzl and was also one of the Founding fathers of Zion of Zionism, uh, he's also he also lived here in Zemun, and there is a street named by both of them in Zemun, which is uh, also interesting. And Marco also mentioned that uh, I guess Albert Einstein's first wife is from Novi Sad and has been a citizen of Novi Sad for a couple of years uh, as well. Yes, she's just not Jewish, but that's okay. We forgive Albert for that. <laughs> um, I yeah, but she is she is from here. Please. Um, I wonder if you could speak uh, to the topic of Jewish foods uh, that a couple of people mm. are interested in knowing if there's any specific Jewish foods connected to Serbia and also what is the situation for kashrut in places like Belgrade and, and any other communities in Serbia. <clears throat> okay, so I'll start maybe from kashrut. Um, there is no, uh, as I said, there is no uh, a kosher shop um, in Belgrade, our rabbi, is a rabbi and he's also shohet. So, uh, if you want kosher meat, he's the only one through which you can you can get it, which is not almost not possible for other places that are not in Belgrade, right? Um, so it's really really hard to uh, keep kosher in if you eat meat, right? If you are vegetarian, it's a different story. If you are vegan, it's it's much easier. But if you are not a vegetarian and this is a very meat loving society, then uh, it's almost impossible. Um, it's also, also impossible to, if you have kids and you're religious and they go to public school, uh, it's impossible for them to um, eat in a Jewish traditional way um, or to, um, not go to school during Jewish holidays, right? So by the law of Serbia, the only holiday we can take is for Yom Kippur, but Jewish calendar doesn't function like that, right? Serbian calendar, Serbian religious calendar function like that. Each family has next to all the Christmas and Easterns and, and public religious holidays, each family has a saint and it's once a year, but for Jews, it's completely different concept. So it's really, really, really hard to be religious Jew in Serbia. Um, and I think probably one of the reasons why they, the community is so secular uh, is also that, but also if you're a religious Jew, you would leave Serbia um, in order to find a wife or a husband, in order to have uh, 
more diverse Jewish life or more options for Jewish uh, religious life, you you would leave uh, you would leave the country. Um, regarding traditional uh, cuisine, it's really the combination of Sephardic and Ashkenazi cuisine. So, for example, the community where Marco is from, it's called Novi Sad. They also have a beautiful, amazing synagogue that unfortunately, because of the number of community members, doesn't really function as a synagogue. It's a concert hall, but at least it's maintained and kept and nurtured. Um, so they are organizing Trulant for all community members of Serbia. So that's very Ashkenazi, Charlotte Trulant, I, I guess you're familiar with that. Um, and, and in Belgrade, you would um, probably eat um, more uh, Sephardic cuisine. There is no, I mean, as I said, maybe for, for Hanukkah, you will eat um, not latkes, I don't even know how you call it in Sephardic, uh, Sephardic um, like in Ladino, but you would eat maybe more Sephardic um, cuisine than, than in other places of Serbia. You might not eat a donut, but you will eat uh, something very oily and very Sephardic. Um, but in general, people, there is, it, it kind of like the language, right? Nobody here actually speaks Yiddish. I don't know one person that speaks Yiddish in all Serbia. And maybe few people speak Ladino. So like the language and the cuisine is kind of mixed. So in terms of language, majority of people will speak Serbian. Some people speak, some Jews speak Hungarian if they are from the city that I'm coming from. Um, and, and English probably, but, but they would not speak Hebrew, they would not speak Ladino, or they would not speak Yiddish, right? So that's, that's just the reality of the, of the community. I don't know if I answered the question, but... Very, very much so. Um, this is kind of a, a two-part. One, just throwing it out there, uh, the, a question has come in about the synagogues, if you happen to have any pictures or, or links, perhaps, of what the inside, the interior um, of the, I guess, the two synagogues that, that you were uh, referencing. And a uh, question that came very early on, uh, a while ago now, what is something interesting, perhaps, that nobody would know about Serbia? Ooh, about <laughs> Serbia. Mm. Oh, wow. It's a tough one. I think it's really, yeah, wow. I mean, Serbia is really very homogenic, homogeneous, very homogeneous. Like we are 105% white. Like rarely there is, uh, there is, yeah, diversity in, in, in those terms, but it's very multinational and multicultural, meaning that except Belgrade, which is a capital, it's very like Orthodox Serbian majority, like you feel majority. Other parts of Serbia have their own minorities, also national, also religious. There is part of Serbia where there are more Muslims living. There is part of Serbia, there are more uh, Croatians and Hungarians, which are Catholics living. And it influences really the, the, the cities and the places. Um, I will talk about Belgrade because I live here for the last 10 years. It's it for me still, it's really after my city, which is half Hungarian, and I lived in Hungary whenever for joined for like 10 years. Belgrade is still really a jungle, but it's very lively. Like it's between Istanbul, it's a combination of Istanbul, Israel, and and some kind of Slavic vibe. Um, so it's very alive, it's a little bit aggressive. Um, for good and for bad, um, people are really, really welcoming. Like, I think Balkan people, I would say mainly Bosnians and Serbians are really welcoming. If you need anything, they will open the door for you. Like they will provide you with whatever you need. So I think that's, that's something that people usually when they think about Serbia, and if you know Serbian history, especially the recent one, um, people, don't, uh, people don't think about that. But, the food is great if you love meat um, and um, if you like cheese as well. It's not like France, but very different uh, type of cheese. Uh, they have very good alcohol. People are in general very alive and happy, um, but with 
all the baggages of very bad politics in the last 50 years with economic crisis, constant economic crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a combination. Um, maybe that's a secret, secret of Serbia. Thank you, Marco, for sharing the website. Obviously. I was just about to say, Marco's on fire with uh, helping us with links uh, and answering questions as we go along. Um, this question is, we'd have to uh, break it down a little bit, uh, but word for word, it's, if the Jewish population is not growing, as you, as mm -hmm. you said, would it not be beneficial to work on emigration of Serbian Jews? Um, I'm not sure what mm -hmm. that means in terms of like bringing more Serbian Jews back to Serbia, or, or helping Serbian Jews uh, in other countries. I'll add a second follow-up to that question and ask mm. what is the relationship of Serbia with Israel currently? Mm -hmm. So maybe let's start, for, I, like, I, I can answer both directions. So um, one, one like the question could possibly be that um, why there are still Jews in Serbia and why don't we help them emigrate like and have a better Jewish life somewhere. It's always a question, I'm not for it. <laughs> Basically, I think it's very important that small Jewish communities maintain um, uh, that, that, that there is a Jewish life, doesn't matter how big, um, and that, that people know about it. I think that's the point. I think for, if you come to visit Serbian Jewish community, they will be so happy, like, they will be so happy. If you tell other people about Serbian communities, I will be very grateful. Um, so, so sometimes it's not about the numbers. If there is, a, maybe the question is about if there is a future of Jewish community in Serbia, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But also, of course, because of, of, of uh, lack of infrastructure, but also assimilation, most of my friends, including me, my mother, as I said, my mother converted, um, come from mixed marriage, community accepts partners, they are part of the Jewish community. Of course, it has halachic implications if you want to participate in the synagogue. So it's very, very complicated, but we can, I think, overcome it. Um, but but uh, so so my answer to that would be I think it's it's important that small Jewish communities exist, not just in Serbia but uh, anywhere. And big Jewish communities can help us in that. Not in terms of numbers, but just in terms of our visibility, and and saying oh you know there is a Jewish community I don't know in small city in Bulgaria I didn't know about it and. It's important that we know because we are part of the Jewish world. Um, you, you kind of answered the, the, it. There, there, there was the person who asked the question, I think codified it and said that they meant mm -hmm. like hel helping them leave. But you kind of answered mm -hmm. it by saying mm -hmm. you prefer not yeah. to help them leave because you want to keep the community alive there and, 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 yeah. and grow I mean, it. I want, yeah, true, I, I, yes, I would, I would keep them here, of course. I, I wish for people to find their places and, and the reasons for Jews to live are, can be very different. Like it can be because of the Jewish life, which I doubt actually, but it can be because they want a better economic life, better political life, whatever their reasons are. Israel is always an option, like for many, many Jews. We know that it's not an easiest country to be. Um, and also I personally, I, like I know that Israel is always my option, but I'm just not ready to go from one conflict zone, which is very different conflict to another conflict zone. So my, my even though I'm a Jewish educator, I love Israel, I have many friends, I have culturally, I'm completely connected to Israel. Like I would never, just if I have to, I would choose Israel, to be honest. Uh, and, and the reason for me, it's really the war environment. Like I just don't want that. Um, but, but of course, many people do choose Israel. As I said, I have many friends that, that left. Um, um, for example, the Jewish Agency for Israel is not, never was present here. We had people who come and, you know, help people with Aliyah, but we never had an office. There was no big immigration from Serbia, also there because of the small numbers uh, from here to Israel. Um, Jewish community connection to Israel, Israel, I would say compared to other communities, like we don't have a say, we don't have a public say about Israel. We also don't discuss Israel so much, which is I think very interesting. So even in terms of like 
education, like educating kids about Israel, it's not in the focus of this community. It was for last 70 years, it was not the focus and it's still not. Like maybe you will teach kids of how the map of Israel looks like, you will take a kid once, uh, once to Israel, um, et, cetera, et cetera, but there is no really uh, education of, of like his, Israeli history uh, in that there is no promotion of Zionism in that sense, et cetera, et cetera. We as organization, we cooperate with Israeli embassy. They support our uh, LGBT festival and we do like projections of Israeli movies because we are like our, it comes from our need to, to build bridges and break stereotypes that Israel is like this and that. And to blame us as Jews of Serbia for whatever is happening in Israel. So, so we have a close connection with the Israeli embassy community as well, but it's not really, there is nothing educational that happens there, I would say. Thank, thank you very much. And, and, and we're happy to ask Catherine uh, to unmute uh, herself um, if possible to, uh, to ask the final question. Here we Hi. are. Hi, thank you very much. I have a uh, glaucoma, so the writing the question is hard. Uh, you said that the uh, Serbian people, or uh, where you were speaking of, are anti-Semitic. And um, you mentioned because of what's going on in, uh, is in Israel. And I, I graduated Hebrew University. I now live uh, in, in the West, in North America. But I find that people are not anti-Semitic. Uh, they're very upset about the present uh, behavior towards the Palestinians. And I think we really have to distinguish when people from outside who aren't Jewish, because there's a lot of Jewish who are against what is going on with the Palestinians uh, and feel the same way, that it is an anti-Semitism. Uh, um, it's uh, their feelings towards not resolving this problem uh, properly or in a better manner and, and causing suffering amongst other people, especially Semites, Palestinians. So I just wanted to say that because uh, anti-Semitism is a terrible term. And in, uh, and in New York and uh, Canada, it immediately uh, says you're like a perpetrator of the Holocaust or uh, you understand mm -hmm. it's a terrible term to accuse people or a country of. So I just needed to add that. And I, I don't think you're yeah, a bad thank person. You. I just think uh, you don't understand that they're really angry about all this trouble with Palestinians. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank and you, Catherine. Thank you. I think it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to add on that because I think it's very important what Catherine said. Um, when I was referring to it, I, I was talking about liberal left LGBT community that um, becomes anti Semitic when they blame me and when they protest in front of my festival because they connected me, they connect me to Israel politics, right? So I'm a Jew and automatically I support everything what Israel does. It's called a modern anti-Semitism. I don't think, I mean, there, of course, there's anti-Semitism in the country that is not connected to Israel and cemeteries are devastated, they're desecrated and this happens. But I was talking about a specific group that is really, um, not anti-Semitic, but by saying, yes, what Israel is doing is horrible to Palestinians and stuff like that, but putting that blame on me, like I'm, it's my fault that this happens. So I just want to distinguish that and thank you for, for pointing that out, Catherine. And I think as a closing, if you didn't mind, Sonia, just to put your email there so people can follow up. I know there's people, for example, who are interested in finding lost Jewish heritage or perhaps roommates that they might have known uh, earlier and want to find them again. So, um, you know, obviously we're happy to uh, connect everyone um, via email with Sonia. And I believe Marco has been very supportive as well uh, throughout this chat. So we have some wonderful resources for everyone uh, to follow up. Yeah. Uh, this is the idea of these enc encounters have always been to open a door and, and, and continue the learning once the session has ended. So please feel free, Sonia, if you wanted to say some closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I would just like to invite you to, to come to Serbia, or if you can't just reach out to me, I will be happy to continue conversation or to be your host here. Um, we organize some tours, but we can organize a tour like independently and um, and yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting area. You can reach half of Europe from here. So why not? Why not? Thank you for being here and being interested in uh, my community. It means a lot. I think you might be able to say, Sonia, this is maybe your largest audience to, to date, right? That you've had. Absolutely. Wow. When I learned from Mara today how many people joined these calls, I was like, oh my God. But it's great. <laughs> I'm so happy that you're curious about Jewish world um, and that you're constantly learning. It's beautiful. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you, Mara and Dani, for invitation as well. Our pleasure. And, and thank you for doing the incredible work that you're doing with uh, the organization, with Haver. And uh, really, it's it's so beautiful for you to be able to virtually share your story as well as uh, the community and the history of Serbia. So we look forward to staying in touch. And Mara, sending it back to you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I've been quiet. I, we had a moment of no sirens here. But uh, thank you all for being here, for touring with us. Thank you, Sonia. This was magnificent. And uh, we'll let you all know soon where we're traveling next. Have a great day. And Chag Sameach Purim to everyone oh, celebrating yeah. next week. Chag Sameach. Bye. Thanks, everybody.